Hello all. Urban mobility has gone through unexpected and momentous changes in 2020. COVID-19 ripped through our nations and cities, bringing individual community and societal upheaval and turmoil. Density and proximity, the very two things that make our cities the economic, cultural, intellectual, political and innovative beating hearts of our society, were also the weakest points when faced with a new and deadly threat. On this occasion, I would like to start this video blog by reviewing how the coronavirus pandemic has had an immense impact on societies across the world and transport has most certainly not been spared its effects. The coronavirus pandemic has had an immense impact on societies across the world and transport has most certainly not been spared its effects. Planes, trains and automobiles and all stops in between have felt its bite as demand for travel plummeted and the economic downturn took hold. But in our cities, the places where most of us live and work, changes are already coming thick and fast and could reshape our urban spaces on a permanent basis. In Paris, plans were already in motion to create hundreds of kilometres of new cycle paths so that residents can get around the city of lights by pedal power rather than using public transport, which is often overcrowded or delayed due to traffic jams. The city's mayor wants to turn Paris into a 15-minute city where all amenities and services are within striking distance. Here in Brussels, on one of the most polluted streets in the city, new cycling infrastructure links the centre of the Belgian capital with the European Quarter, home of the EU institutions, in an effort to cut down pollution and allow people to social distance. The link between air pollution and respiratory diseases is well documented, and as our understanding of COVID-19 increases, it is becoming clear that cleaning up urban airways is going to become an increasingly important stage in managing the virus. City officials here in Brussels have promised kilometers of new cycle paths for that very reason. But they have resisted the urge to throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you will. One of the new bike lanes will link the centre to the main airport. Here is what some of Brussels residents have to say about it. I cycle pretty much every day and I've seen over the last few years it's got better and better. Um, but there's big gaps still that need to be filled. The street behind us used to be suicide to cycle down it, and now it's better thanks to what they've put there. But as you can see, it's kind of concrete blocks, and then about 100 yards down there, it just leaves you in the middle of the street again. I have noticed that a lot more people use uh, their bikes to get around. I still don't because I'm still scared, but hopefully um, with all of the increase in bike traffic, it's going to be easier and safer from now on. I cycle pretty much every day to get to work, to go, to go through town. And generally speaking, I think it's a good thing that more space is being cleared up for cyclists throughout the city. A lot of these cycling lanes are made in a very temporary fashion, but overall it's probably a good step towards a better cycling city. But there are challenges, as not every city has the space needed to build cycle paths that are separated from cars, vans and buses. On the street behind me, you can see a classic of the problematic biking genre. Two narrow cycle lanes with no road dividers running along a one-way street next to parked cars. Just one inattentive driver opening their door without due care could spell disaster. It is not an impossible problem to solve, though. The Netherlands, inextricably linked to the bicycle, has admittedly built up its world-leading infrastructure over the course of several decades, but offers plenty of lessons and best practices to all those city planners now mulling how to retool urban spaces. It is ultimately a virtuous circle. A safer, more extensive bike network should mean more drivers leaving their cars at home, which in turn creates more space for cyclists and pedestrians. But the pandemic is not a complete panacea. In Berlin, a court ruled that pop-up cycle paths installed during the lockdown period are not legal as local authorities did not go through the right channels. There has also been pushback from motorists in cities like Brussels, London and Milan. So the pandemic has clearly provided a huge boost to movements that want to make cities more people friendly and more sustainable in terms of pollution and human health. It is now up to local authorities and civil society groups to take the opportunity the virus has presented them and run with it. After just a few months, changes are already evident. Here the car was once king of this charming square, but people have now been given agency over it. Although the Belgian weather really lends itself to outside dining, the shift has created a quieter, more peaceful neighbourhood, which many city residents want to see replicated wherever possible. Indeed, who we are today, how we relate to each other and how we perceive and move around our cities has changed in the last year, maybe forever. 
To learn more about how urban mobility has changed due to COVID-19 restrictions and how we are facing these new challenges from the EAT urban mobility, I would like to welcome Juliana Vinierczyk, Innovation Lifecycle Officer for the EAT Urban Mobility. Juliana, welcome. Hi, Josabel. EAT Urban Mobility was privileged to play a small role in COVID-19 response initiatives. Back in 2020, we launched a call for projects that contributed to fight the spread of the coronavirus in cities. Can you tell us, Juliana, more about how the selected projects contributed to boost public realm in cities and to reduce the spread of the coronavirus? Uh, yes, thank you for the great introduction. And indeed, I totally agree the last year have significantly changed our urban life and also the way we move around our cities. Our study of 16 European cities from the last year has shown uh, that um, the reliance on the shared and public transit has decreased significantly during the pandemic while shift towards um, private modes such as cycling, walking and uh, private vehicles has increased considerably. So the development of the last year has also contributed significantly to greater virtualization but at the same time localization of our activities within the cities and in this way, promoting the expansion of existing proximity concepts, such as, for example, the super blocks of uh, Barcelona, but also uh, accelerating implementation of the new ones, um, such as, for example, the 15 minute city of Milan or Paris, or even one minute city of Stockholm, implying that all the necessary utilities you need, uh, starting from outdoor gym to social hubs, can be found within the proximity of your street. So in general, over the last year, cities have experienced great demand for high quality and accessible public realm. So this created a great momentum for um, temporary street experiments and temporary street transformations where citizens actually play active role in the design and creation of their immediate uh, urban environment. For example, such projects as CLEAR help cities of Amsterdam, Munich and Milan experiment all over the space that was reclaimed from vehicle infrastructure but it also helped us, let's say, citizens, uh, to get the feeling, to get the glimpse how our future cities might look like. So the project funded within our COVID response initiative turned to be very successful. In the short time, less than six months, um, the funded projects were able to deliver innovative solutions, enabling safe um, transportation for the citizens, but also creating opportunities for safe social interaction. When we speak about public realm, one such good example could be our Furnish project, which delivered uh, seven prototypes of movable street um, furniture in seven European cities. So all of these uh, prototypes were digitally fabricated in Fab Labs and the documentation is now available in open source repository. This implies that these uh, prototypes can be easily replicated anywhere around the world. So all in all, it's a good example how with the simple um, interventions, public space can be activated for various social uses in a functional, aesthetical, but also in a fun way. Juliana, you just mentioned something really important. You mentioned a project we funded last year, Furnish, which is a very good example of the scope of the EAT urban mobility contributing to boost public realm. Uh, let's learn more about this project and how it boosted public realm, which certainly reconfigured cities and public spaces in Europe.
Iliana Vinyarchuk, Innovation Life Cycle Officer for the EAT Urban Mobility. Thanks a lot for being with us today. Thank you, Josephal. Bye. We already learned a little bit more of what we do at EAT Urban Mobility. We've also learned more about the project, Furnish. Another project that we happily supported last year and still support the current one is CLEAR, City Livability by Redesign. This project, led by the Commune di Milano, is focused on launching real-life transition experiments in urban streets by means of small tangible interventions in combination with alternative mobility concepts. To learn more about this project, we have Rosella Ferrorelli, urban designer and project manager of CLEAR. Rosella, welcome. Hi all, and many thanks for this invitation from a sunny Milan. Rosella, CLEAR joined the portfolio of projects last year and still continues with us in 2021. Tell us, what's the main challenge that CLEAR has gone through since the start and how did you face it? Well, actually, when you deal with projects that have a strong relationship between uh, uh, citizen participation and the project itself and the urban life within public spaces uh, well having a global pandemic to face is like the worst nightmare uh, really the strongest challenge that you can that you can meet um, and as you know clear works on transition experiments meaning that our aim is to change urban spaces from the realm of the pub, pub, private car to a fully public realm where active mobility and even more so for pedestrian mobility uh, specifically uh, that becomes the best way to experience the city for us so um, what we did was try different paths to keep on involving citizens in a way in the urban change trying to be our best to get around the obstacle of the health emergency so first, uh, from one side, we involved a young company able to create virtual environments where to realize digital citizen engagement activities through a very immersive, uh, immersive and innovative 3D interface of co-design. And from the other side, secondly, we involved, uh, involved artists to realize a physical transition experiment in the cities so to be able in a way to mediate the process of citizen engagement through the lens of beauty design and creativity while waiting for this very difficult storm to pass Rosella I'm very aware that the team behind clear has intensively worked boosting public realm all over last year and during the current one in your opinion, what could you say that was the major achievement of CLEAR and what was the difference you made in urban mobility and specifically in public realm? Well, I think that we left urban environments that are much better now than how we found them. In both Milan and Munich, we made important physical changes in public spaces in both the cities. These changes are now uh, still temporary, some of them are temporary uh, and experimental of course, but we are working to make them fully permanent and to give these spaces back to the citizens as beautiful places to enjoy the best from urban life. At the same time, in, uh, in Amsterdam, where we went digital, as I said, I think we are building an exceptionally powerful tool that will help so many cities uh, to co-plan and co-design spaces with citizens under every possible con condition. Rosella Ferrorelli, urban designer and project manager of CLEAR, thanks a lot for joining us today and for sharing these insights with us. Thank you, it's been a pleasure as always. Interesting to see how projects from all over Europe are working closely and more importantly together in these times of social distancing to face a common threat the coronavirus. Good for them and please keep up with the good work. We all need you to recover the highest level of normality in our daily lives again. Another sector that has intensively worked and is keeping up with the good work in this regard is certainly the academic one. We would like to learn more about the initiatives that this sector in collaboration with us have launched all over the year and the current one. And for that, 
I'm happy to welcome Benjamin Badner, Chair of the Urban Structure and Transport Planning at the Technical University of Munich. Benjamin, welcome. So also a very warm welcome from my side. Thanks for joining us today. Benjamin, over the last year, the EIT Urban Mobility Academy launched seven projects with a clear focus on public realm. Can you tell us more about these projects and how they have contributed to boost public realm in cities? It's my real pleasure to talk about public realm because I truly believe that a public realm is essential for our democracy. So we have to create uh, places which are inclusive, no matter if you're old, young, handicapped, rich, poor, everyone should have the opportunity to meet, to interact and to fulfill her or his uh, basic needs. As you can already tell from uh, both Uliana's and uh, Rosella's uh, statements, um, this is uh, very important and EAT Urban Mobility uh, supported uh, these uh, essential uh, activities and I'm uh, very happy about this. I'm also very glad that I could be part of the CLEAR project which Rosella already presented. So I will not get too much into detail here. I just want to mention that uh, street experiments, so trying something for a limited time frame, has proven to be very uh, effective um, in order to shape our cities uh, according to the needs of our citizens. So the participatory aspect here should not be neglected and this is key. So there are different um, uh, procedures behind running these experiments. So it can be a bottom up grassroots movements, for instance, can also be top down where uh, cities dictate uh, what should be done, which ideally is embedded in a, a vision a city is, is working towards. So we learned a lot from uh, CLEAR, especially within our three uh, cities. To name them, it's Amsterdam, Milan and Munich. And based on these rich findings, we decided to uh, develop a street experiment tool. So that's a new project also funded with an EIT Urban Mobility set. You can look up streetexperiments.com so you will find many different examples from street experiments from all over Europe. And we want to build on this. So we will create a platform where whoever wants to conduct a street experiment within their city uh, can see who already done something similar and uh, check if this is transferable or not. We will guide them. We will let them know who did it. So we will give uh, the experts and we will also create um, a little uh, guidance kit so that cities have an idea how they can uh, successfully try something on their streets. Also, if we um, talk about uh, street experiments, there are different uh, experiments. For instance, uh, summer streets, where you have like a section of a street that is uh, closed for cars, or we should better say open for uh, pedestrians and cyclists. Um, or we could also think about um, repurposing um, uh, even public spaces. So, for instance, if we talk about uh, this, uh, we have an example in Munich, Piazza Zinetti, where we got rid of some uh, parking, replaced this by a mobility hub. So we provided uh, car sharing, bike sharing, scooters, and a freed up space from the parking for um, uh, public realm. So we created a nice uh, public space where people could uh, meet, sit, do urban gardening, whatever was on their mind. So they could really uh, take this freed up a space and use it uh, with, with whatever they find most um, appropriate. So again, uh, it's key to really involve the neighbors, the citizens themselves 
to um, make these uh, experiments work. Great examples you can also find in Reclaiming the Streets, a MOOC that uh, good friends of mine have developed, Marco de Brummelstrud and George Lu from the University of Amsterdam. And we would like to um, follow up on this and will develop a new MOOC uh, targeting at uh, planning um, practitioners, uh, professionals. And uh, we will develop this until the end of this year. So um, if you're interested, um, uh, we will keep you informed. Other activities in line with this, I should mention the annual forum from the Doctoral Training Network. This will take place on the 27th to 29th of September in Munich. And uh, we would uh, like to welcome all of you that are interested within uh, this beautiful community. Our overarching topic here will also be street experiments and public realm. The doctoral training network is not just for PhD students, but we will also uh, involve uh, cities, city officials, NGOs, uh, industry partners. So you, there will be a wide range of different stakeholders who are active in urban mobility and especially interested in uh, creating a public realm. Benjamin, we all know that these are not the only projects that were carried out over the last year. We did an extra effort, and precisely extra is the name of a very interesting project run by our academy within the last year. Could you tell us more about this project, the challenges it addressed, and of course, the main accomplishments? Extra is a project, a European project within Urban Europe, where many of our partners from the CLEAR and SET uh, projects are also active. EXTRA stands for Experimenting with City Streets to Transform Urban Mobility. And we have uh, different living labs uh, that I would like just to mention briefly. Amsterdam, so Luca Bertolini, who has been active also in CLEAR and SET, is the lead partner. He's very interested about um, looking if those experiment uh, contribute to a systematic change in our cities. Then we have in Italy, uh, Bologna and Milan, uh, Polimi is uh, supporting us here. Then we have uh, Frank Whitlocks from uh, University of Ghent. Ghent is uh, well known uh, all over the world for their living streets. Uh, and then we have uh, London, Enrica Papa, she is um, uh, leading a work package on convivial urban spaces. And uh, last but not least, we also have Munich, where we are leading a work package on um, accessibility by proximity. So basically, uh, how can we uh, shorten uh, our uh, distances? So it's not important for us to really um, being as fast as possible but more creating livable urban spaces by a density, by mixed use, uh, by public spaces. Uh, so the, the 15 minutes concept here uh, comes into play. Last but not least, I would also like to uh, mention uh, one very interesting uh, new activity uh, which has been created uh, within the doctoral training network from EIT uh, Urban Mobility Academy, where we uh, founded a new journal of urban mobility in cooperation with Elsevier. Here we will soon publish two calls for papers. Um, one is dealing about uh, the long-term um, consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. So how can we really uh, plan our cities in a more uh, resilient way? And how uh, did uh, COVID-19 change our uh, cities and uh, the way that we are moving? And another special issue on uh, the 15 minutes concept 
and how we can provide accessibility by proximity. So if you're interested in these topics, uh, we are very much looking forward to receiving your manuscripts. And this does not only go out to academics. So one unique factor of the Journal of Urban Mobility is that uh, we really encourage all kind of partners who are active in the field of urban mobility will submit their uh, papers. So uh, that could be city officials, industry partners, NGOs, whatsoever. So if you're interested, feel free to reach out and submit uh, your research to the Journal of Urban Mobility. Benjamin Badner, Chair of Urban Structure and Transport Planning at the Technical University of Munich. Thanks a lot for being with us today. I'm very much looking forward to shaping this uh, with all of you. And uh, thank you once again for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. And to close this video blog, I would like to give a warm welcome to Florinda Boschetti, Director of City Club at the EOT Urban Mobility. Florinda, welcome. Hello, Isabel, and thank you. Florinda, public realm was very important before the virus, but it has proved to be even more important during the COVID-19 pandemic. In your opinion, why public realm is so needed to make our urban spaces more livable and the quality of life of citizens higher and better? I can briefly try and summarize my three good reasons why I think we, as a community and as citizens, shall protect and cherish urban spaces. Now, public spaces are the essence and an important asset to our cities. Public spaces provide people many opportunities to come together, have social interactions, exchange creative ideas, shape innovations, exchange services and goods, and also exercising and staying fit. Public spaces provide also a place to engage with the community and with the public sphere. Now, the second point is uh, more about uh, the impact that the design and the quality of public space have on the city's transport system, which in return can influence travel behaviors and have a positive impact on the environment, including air quality, and on people's physical and mental well-being. And the third point is that reimagining public spaces as part of urban design policies contributes to shaping an attractive and vibrant city where people want to go to and stay. Florinda, during this video blog, we've just learned more about some of the projects and initiatives on public realm that the EIT Urban Mobility is carrying out. And we recently closed the call for proposals on public realm. Can you tell us how many applications we received and what is expected and what will be the outcome of this call? This was a new call for tactical urbanism and interventions in the public realm, building on the existing city while the public space regeneration plans and strategies. We have received four project proposals. Uh, these will now be assessed by a panel of external evaluators and projects will kick off next year in 2022. So stay tuned to learn more about the projects receiving renting. But more to this, there's another call which is open for cities and regions to apply locally one of the three EIT urban mobility solutions on creating public realm, notably CLEAR, a citizens engagement web tool for co-designing and planning public space. RAPID, using rapid prototyping in 3D to support city decision making. And FURNISH, which works with tactical urbanism to reconfigure public spaces connected to schools or educational centers. Now, the call was launched just a few days ago by the EA Turban Mobility and the Climate Kick in the frame of the new European Bauhaus Initiative. This call is open until the 10th of May. Public administrations and affiliated entities are encouraged to apply and receive a grant up to 30,000 euros to deploy their preferred solution. So we look forward to receiving many applications. Florinda Boschetti, Director of City Club for the EIT Urban Mobility, thank you very much for your time today and for sharing these insights and, of course, for the impressive work you're doing. Please keep up. Thank you, Isabel. Have a good day. So, as you can see from the EAT Urban Mobility, we will all remember 2020 as an unforgettable year that has shaped our thinking on where EAT Urban Mobility needs to go. We learned we could move fast and innovate at a pace. 
And we also learned that the right thinkers and doers are there. We just need to find them. We learned that innovation can be financially beneficial and contribute to sustainable growth. But don't you think we will stop here? The best is yet to come. So stay tuned. More news on EIT Urban Mobility will come soon. Bye bye.